ओम सदा शिव समारंभाचार्य ओके सो वी विल chant the first two verses two mantras so pratama mundake pratama khanda brahma devanam prathama sambhabhuva brahma devanam sambhabhuva vishvasya karta bhuvanasya gopta vishvasya karta bhuvanasya gopta स ब्रह्म विद्या विद्या प्रतिष्ठा अथर्वाय ज्येष्ठ पुत्रा आह अथर्वणे प्रवदेत ब्रह्म अथर्वाचांगिरे ब्रह्म विद्या स भारद्वाजाय सत्यवाहाय प्राह भारद्वाजोंगिरसे ओके सो वी हैड सीन द फर्स्ट मंत्र इन द लास्ट क्लास एंड नाउ वी विल लुक एट दिस मंत्र आई विल फर्स्ट जस्ट गिव यू द वर्ड मीनिंग्स सो पुरा पुरा मींस इन एंशियंट टाइम्स इन द बिगिनिंग अथर्वा उवाच सो अथर्वा सेड अथर्वा गिव द टीचिंग अंगिरे टू अंगिर सो यू हेव टू गेट ऑल दीज वर्ड्स फ्रॉम इन साइड अथर्वा इज द सेकेंड लाइन अंगिर इज ऑल्सो देर सो यू आर ब्रेकिंग द मॉल अप सो पुरा उवाच अथर्वा उवाच पुरा अथर्वा सर इन द एंशियन टाइम्स अंगिरे इज सेट टू अंगिर which means in ancient times he was giving the knowledge the gnanam he was teaching angira and tam brahma vidya what was the knowledge that brahma vidya and which brahma vidya yam brahma pravadet atharvane so that same brahma vidya which lord brahma ji had given atharva athora is now imparting that vidya to angira so that tam and yam is very important because it's indicating it is the same knowledge in a undiluted form which is being passed on then saha <clears throat> saha is no angira saha satyavahaya praha he taught to satyavaha <coughs> bharadwajaya so bharadwaja is the is the clan <coughs> is a gotram and so satyavaha is a descendant of bharadwaja एंड भारद्वाज टॉट परावराम द ट्रेडिशनल विजडम अंगिर से तो अंगिर सो थ्री लिंक्स इन दी परंपरा आर बीइंग मेंशन सो याम अथर्वणे ब्रह्म पर्वदेत दैट सेम ब्रह्म ज्ञानम व्हिच वाज टॉट टू अथर्वा बाय ब्रह्म वाज टॉट बाय अथर्वा टू अंगि without any distortion in any form <coughs> so atharva taught and now look at the next word paravaram so literally para means superior and avara means inferior so it is being used together the superior inferior knowledge it's being used together why is that so because shankara gives two different meanings he says that 
One is it can refer to the method of the teaching, the method of transmission of the knowledge. It is from guru to shishya. So from a higher entity to a lower entity, higher in the sense, person with a higher amount of knowledge to a lower entity. And <clears throat> physically also, not only in the old days, even today, the teacher is always seated at a higher level on a dais or on a platform or something and the student at the lower level. So the teaching is from the higher level to the lower level. So the person who is more knowledgeable is teaching the person who is less knowledgeable. That is one method of interpretation of Paravara. And Shankara adds in his commentary that this rule is applicable at each level. So the teacher is always at a higher level than the student until the student gets accomplished. Therefore, at each of these levels in the Sampradaya, in the Parampara, Lord Brahma Ji to Atharva, Atharva to Angiras and onwards. And that is why the word Paravaram is used to refer to the, the teaching uh, methodology, how it is being taught, by whom to whom. That is one interpretation. And Shankara himself gives the second interpretation of Paravara. He says it can be adjective to Vidya. So Paravidya, Aparavidya. So higher Vidya, Brahma Vidya is, is Paravidya. And Aparavidya means all the other types of knowledge. That is one. <clears throat> there is another interpretation that Paravidya can deal with Nirguna Brahman <clears throat> and Aparavidya can deal with Saguna Brahman. So this Brahma Vidya was taught and then Satyavaha taught Angiras. Incidentally, this is why this the reason, the first reason of, you know, the teaching being given from a higher level to the lower level. This is why sometimes Ganga, the Ganges river, is compared to Brahma Vidya because it always flows from a higher level, higher plane to a lower plane. And similarly, Brahma Vidya also flows from a higher plane to a lower plane. Another similarity is that the Ganga is a perennial river. There is no time of the year when it dries up. And similarly, Brahma Vidya. There is no time where it ever dries up. It continues to exist. So, <clears throat> you can say that Brahma Vidya does not deteriorate over any time. That is also one of the interpretations. You will see that uh, in a later part of this Upanishad, in, in the second uh, chapter, we will see that the word Paravidya, para apara is also used directly as another name for Brahman. Okay, so that is, you have to learn to be comfortable with uh, various usages of the same word. It is always contextual. So, so far in Bhagavad Gita it was there, but to a limited extent. But now you will find that, especially in Shankara Bhashim, you will find that Shankara uses the words differently in different uh, you know, sometimes in different verses in the same chapter itself. And of course, sometimes in different chapters. Now, in his Vaishyam, Shankara gives another meaning also. So there are very various meanings coming. It is important for us to uh, know all these meanings because where we are going to use, in which context, that will come later. But here, Shankara gives another meaning. So he says, para para Sarva Vidya Vyapte means that para apara is that which pervades all the uh, two types of vidya. The para vidya also it per, uh, pervades, apara vidya also it pervades. So directly referring to it as Brahman, because the all pervading one is Brahman itself. And therefore, these let us remember all these things. Now, what is the methodology of teaching? So, let us say that you are going to Rishikesh and you want to take a bath in the Ganga, right? Now, you can't just, the Ganga flows a lot of, over a lot of territory. You can't just go anywhere. But if you go anywhere, there, it might be too strong and you might get carried away. And therefore, there are these ghats. Literally, the ghats is, is a place where steps are there and railings are also there. 
and especially in Rishikesh, if you go, you will find that there are some iron rods driven into the cement, and from those iron rods, you have iron chains hanging. And the flow is so strong, so everybody, everybody tells you that please hold the chain when you get into the water. Now, those, only those who have been there will know the the wisdom of their advice because the water looks not too great, not too you know strong in flow, but the moment you step in it, you will find that your legs are pulled away, and therefore it is important to hold on to the chain. So here also, we say that when you study the Vedanta. You have to study safely. So you have to go to the Guru, you have to go to the Acharya. And with the Acharya, you hold on to the Acharya and then you take a dip in the waters of the Veda. So that you are what you call going to learn safely and correctly also. And therefore, the <coughs> Parampara is mentioned here that each person has a Guru. The idea of this whole exercise is that each person Nobody learns on his own. He always goes to a teacher so that he understands correctly. And that correct understanding is important. That is what is meant by safety. Because you can also, if you study on your own, your views will be, your understanding will be covered by your, your own uh, likes and dislikes, your own interpretations. And you might end up with completely contradictory in understanding than that to what is intended by Shastra. And that is why so many um, rishis are mentioned here in the in the in the in the parampara in the sampradaya. Remember that the rishis are not creators of the pramanam, right? They they are not what is called pramana kartru. They are not. They don't create the pramanam. Who is the creator of the pramanam? Pramanam here is what the Upanishad itself. Who is the creator of that Upanishad? Only Ishvara. Therefore, rishis are not to be taken as pramana kartras. They are sampradaya kartras. So, sampradaya is the one who carries on the teaching. The pramanam is Upanishad. The Upanishadic teaching is, is carried on from generation to generation by the rishis. And therefore, the rishis are sampradaya kartras. <clears throat> that is one reason why this parampara is indicated. The second reason is that there is a methodology of teaching which we will be seeing. Which actually, we have seen this in chapter 13 of the Gita, but we will be seeing it again and again. And therefore, the mention of the parampara is to indicate that the sampradaya is indicated. There is a method of acquiring knowledge and the method of acquiring knowledge has to be used to disperse the knowledge also. You have to teach also in the same way in which you acquire. So there is, you, you first give a adhyasa, superimposition. And then you do negation, apavada. So adhyasa apavada is the sampradaya. The way of teaching is to introduce something first and then negate it. That is the sampradaya which is being talked about. That sampradayic methodology has to be learned from the teacher through his teaching only. And you use the same methodology for teaching. Right? And therefore, Shankara says in his commentary that even if you are a Shastragnya, you are well versed in Shastra, and for example, in grammar, you know, Mimamsa Shastram, you know, he says, Swatantrena Brahma Anaveshanam Nakurya. Even if you are a Shastragnya, even if you are well versed in, the, in grammar, in the, the uh, subsidiary, you know, disciplines, as well as the Shastra itself, you should not independent, independently enquire into Brahman. So, Swatantriyana, independently, Brahma Anaveshanam na Kuriya. Anaveshanam is enquiry. So, don't enquire into Brahman independently. That is because the Shastram itself, the Upanishad itself, presents the teaching in the form of a particular methodology, the Sampradaya, and therefore only one who has understood can is able to handle these words, is able to teach properly. So, in fact, in Bhagavad Gita in the 13th chapter, I don't know if we did this portion during the teaching, but he says that the person who is 
who doesn't understand the meaning of the Shastram, so Shastra Sampradaya Rahitva, Rahitatvat, the person who doesn't understand the meaning of the Shastric words, what does he do? Shrutahanim Ashruta Kalpana Kuruvan. He gives his own interpretation, which is against the interpretation of the Veda. Ashruta Kalpana. Veda has never interpreted that. But he gives his own interpretation. And by doing that, number one, he is deluded. And number two, he deludes and confuses others. And therefore, there is a very, very famous saying from Shankaracharya in that particular section of the Bhagavad Gita where he says, Tasmat, therefore, Asampradaya with Sarva Shastra with Api. Sarva Shastra with Api. Even if your teacher or the person is very well versed in the Shastram and its subsidiary its disciplines like grammar and you know Mimamsa and etymology, all that is well versed. But Asampradaya with he is not part of the Sampradaya. He is not well versed in the Sampradaya. How to unfold the teaching? What should you do? Murkhavat Upekshaniyam. Avoid him just in the same manner as you would avoid a fool. So he is saying that anybody who tries to teach without knowing the Sampradayic methodology of teaching, you should not go to that person at all. Because he is confused and he will confuse you also. So therefore all this we are talking about to indicate that it is the intention of the Shruti <laughs> to say that you should go to a teacher of the Sampradaya and then learn. We saw this in Bhagavad Gita also. Krishna said, go to the teacher and learn from him. Okay, so then we go on to the next line. Saha. Now, Saha here refers to who? Angira. Angi. Saha. That Angi. Bharadvajaya Satyavahaya Praha. So, Angi taught it to Satyavaha. Satyavaha, Satyavaha literally means Satyavahanam, the, the vehicle carrying the truth, you know, which is another name for Bharadwaja. So, Bharadwaja, Satyavaha are not two different people. Bharadwaja is another name for Satyavaha. So, Angi taught Satyavahaya and then what did he do? That Satyavahaya, now in the next line he calls him Bharadwaja. Okay, so don't get confused. Bharadvajaya Satyavahaya Praha means Saha refers to Angir, Angiras. Angiras taught Satyavahaya, who is a descendant or who is part of the Bharadvaja dynasty. He taught him. That is the third line. And the fourth line is Bharadvaja. Bharadvaja here is indicating who? Satyavaha. So Satyavaha Angirase Paravara. Angiras taught Angiras. So first there was Angi and then there was Angiras, two different people. So Lord Brahma Ji to Atharvana, Atharvana to Angi, Angi to Satyavahaya, Satyavahaya to Angiras. Here is a Paramparic model. These people are part of the Parampara. Truth is saying that this is how the teaching should take place in the form of a Parampara. And also, because of the indication earlier, each person teaches exactly in the same manner that he was taught. He doesn't change the essential meaning. It doesn't mean that you should use the teacher's words, because that might mean that you are not understood. But the basic concept should be the name, should be the same. And you can, of course, change the examples, change the, change the, you know, in changing times, examples naturally change. So if somebody used the example of a cow earlier, you can use the example of a mobile phone you know, or a laptop. All these things can be used. Examples can change. The basic teaching can never change. Okay, that is mantra number two. And now we will look at mantra number three. We will chat. Acharya ji. Aji. Uh, so I have two questions. Yeah. The first one is when we talk about uh, the methodology of teaching, I Atiyasa Papada. Yeah. Is like in, 
is like in Tartu Aboda that first anatma is the superimposition is introduced yes. and then we negate anatma. Yes, exactly. Okay. That is that is a superimposition and negation. It okay. is the way you introduced what you can see. Mm -hmm. right. What is perceptible to us is Jagat, the world. Mm -hmm. So the world is introduced and then you later on say the world really doesn't exist because there is Mithya and that's how mm -hmm. you negate. So that okay. methodology is the Sampradaya. Okay. And for that you will find that we have various prakriyas. You have your three bodies, you have your Panchakosha, Srishti Prakriya is there. So during the Upanishad, you will find different Upanishads use different uh, methodologies in the sense, different examples as teaching Prakriya. Prakriya is a methodology. Mm -hmm. But the basic Sampradaya is introduce, make them understand and negate. Okay, thank you. And just to check uh, if my understanding was correct of this verse. So first, uh, Atharva took the knowledge to Angira and then Angira to Satyavahaya. Correct. And that's all. No, Satyavaha taught to somebody called Angiras. Ah, that's that was the nutrition. Angiras is different from Angi. Angira. Okay. Angira. Okay. okay. Two very similar names. Got it, got it. Thank you so much. All right. So we chant the, the next verse, the, the next mantra. We should not be seeing the word verse. Shauna ko hawai maha shalaha. Shauna ko hawai maha shalaha. Angirasam vidivat upasannaf papracha. Angira Vignatam Okay. So now the um, parampara is emerging. What was the parampara? Lord Brahmaji. Then Lord Brahmaji taught Atharvana. So then Atharvana became a teacher. Atharvana taught, taught Angi. He became a teacher. Angi taught Satyavahaya. He became a teacher. Satyavahaya taught Angiras. And Angiras is now the current teacher in the parampara. So that you have to remember that right now, we are talking about the current teacher, Asmad, Asmad Acharya. Asmad Acharya is where? In your... Where do you the, find that? The prayer. Opening prayer. In the, in the prayer. So Asmad Acharya yes. here, my Acharya, the current teaching Acharya is who? It is Angiras. Right. So now, look at the words. Chaunakaha Mahashalaha so, Shanaka is a great uh, ritualist, a great householder. Hawaii. So, that individual things are explained later. So, Shaunakaha, Mahashalaha, the great householder. Angirasam Upasannaha. He approached. Upasannam means to approach. Upasan, Upasan, Angirasam. Why Angirasam? Because Angirasam right now is the teacher. And Vidivat, in the prescribed manner, so each of these words will explain. Vidivat, he approached in the prescribed manner. And Papracha Iti, he asked him in this manner, Bhagavaha, hey Lord, oh Lord, oh hey Bhagavan, Kasminnu, what is that? So what is that? You can you say, it. what is that fundamental entity? What is that basic entity? Vignate, knowing which, Knowing which, that knowing that fundamental entity, sarvam idam vignatam bhavati. Everything else here becomes known. Sarvam idam means all this bhavati vignatam becomes known. So this is a very fundamental question. And how it is impacting us, let us see. So what is the story? There is a great householder called Shaunaka. He approached Angira in the prescribed manner and said that 
what is it what is that entity o oh lord having known that entity everything else here becomes known so this is the sixth rishi in the parampara and angiras taught this brahma vidya to shaunaka and there are some lessons here which you should learn first which we keep on repeating again and again because upanishad and shankaracharya are very explicit on this one should always approach a guru or a teacher never attempt self study not only just of the veda of the upanishad even of the puranas and the itihas also we should not attempt self study and this is not followed by everybody everybody thinks is an expert in itihasa because after all it is only a story and therefore you have people who have not studied vedanta who do not understand shastram the basic tatparyam the basic essential teaching of the shastram is not understood and then they have these stories you know kathas where puranas and itihasas are explained wrongly because they don't connect it to the basic teaching the teachings in the puranas and the itihasas they are only implicit they are not explicit and therefore one has to understand from the teacher otherwise you get you get you know uh, questions like how can you say that dronacharya was a great man because he cut off the finger of ekalavya who was his, you know all those kind of questions can arise that rama shot an arrow while hiding say grama sent sita sita to the forest and she was pregnant and therefore we say that there is a key to understanding all the scriptures just by reading you are not going to understand it. you have to first understand the methodology and there is a shastram called mimamsa shastram which explains this deals with how to understand the scriptures it is a very major uh, text it has i think 12 chapters and more than 2000 sutras anyway so let's come back to mahashala so mahashala angirasam so if you look at the word it is mahashala angiras so mahashala is what literally a shala in sanskrit or even in hindi a shala means a big hall i mean a great hall and mahashala means a, a huge hall and shalas are used for doing yagyas so yagya shala that we call it and mahashala is a very big hall and that if you look at the mantra there is a visarga after mahashala mahashala ha so in sanskrit that visarga converts it into a subject case kathama vibhakti which means it becomes the subject of the sentence and by putting the visarga there mahashala is converted to a noun right so it indicates that shaunaka was a mahashala shaunaka was a great householder that is the meaning so it's a name given to shaunaka shaunaka was a great householder and what did this householder do because of the use of the mahashala you have to you have to you have to derive that he conducted a lot of yagnyas he did a lot of yagnyas because shala is a yagnya shala it's a great hall where yagnyas are done lot of rituals are done and therefore this mahashala had did lot of yagnyas which means he was a great karma yogi he was a very established and very accomplished karma yogi and if you are accomplished karma yogi there are two things here to be derived who is entitled to do a yagnya he is the only the householder is entitled in veda you cannot vedic in the karma kanda you cannot do a yagnya unless you have a wife so you are a householder the word the adjective mahashala here indicates that number 1 shaunaka was a householder he had a wife which means in his grahastha ashram he has been successful how because he has come to gnanam and who comes to gnanam somebody who has sadhana chatushtaya sampatti so mahashala here says that this shaunaka was a grahastha we had done a lot of um, vedic rituals karm karma se dan yagnyas he has done and because of all those yagnyas he is now sadhana chatushtaya sampanna he has got the sadhana chatushtaya sampatti and because of that he has come to gnanam then there are two words h and y so these are what we call 
in english particles they are just you know they don't add meaning to the sentence they are used only for emphasis and you will find this in a lot of vedic mantras so you have to learn to recognize them because they don't really have a meaning they are just to indicate so for example in english we say indeed or you know somebody is talking about something and we will say indeed or we say really so you are not adding to the you are saying this guy is let us say this man is a very knowledgeable person so he is really a really knowledgeable person by saying that this person is a knowledgeable person and is a really knowledgeable person you are not adding any any real meaning a knowledgeable person is a knowledgeable person therefore these are the particles uh, and why indeed really any exclamation you might that kind of a thing is so how why are they particles and they are there only to number 1 show that he was indeed a great householder and number 2 to, to complete the meter then what happened vidivad upasanna ha vidivat means in accordance with the vedic vidhi in accordance with the vedic prescribed manner upasannaha he approached he approached whom he approached angiras therefore here <clears throat> what the teaching is also there that the disciple the student has to approach the guru right and vidivat according to the stipulation of the shastra and shastra usually says that you approach with a bundle of dry twigs you know when you you don't take crores of rupees with you when you go to your teacher you are going to the gurukula and gurukula what you need is you need uh, dried twigs for performing vedic rituals so the usual vidivat is that you go to the teacher carrying a you know small bundle of dry twigs indicating that i am ready to come to you and in and abide by your instructions and this is a small offering i am contributing to the continuance of vedic rituals in the gurukula so vidivat and there is a rule in shastram rikta pani hi rikta pa, rikta means without anything or empty rikta pani is what hands not water tatvada we know pani means water it is the na the, the second na pani rikta pani hi with empty hands nagachet do not go rajanam devatam gurum so rikta pani hi nagachet rajanam devatam gurum with empty hands do not go to the king to your gods and to the guru okay so that's part of the reason why when you approach a guru you need not you know take diamonds with you you take only a very minimal offering which is going to be useful to that teacher to the to, to the ashram in this case to the gurukula and when you approach the guru with that offering in your hands you are making a symbolic statement what is that symbolic statement this dry twig which you are taking you know it is useful of course in the gurukulam for the conduct conducting of vedic rituals but what is the speciality of dry twigs they catch fire quickly and the student is therefore saying that i have done enough karma kanda work i have done yagnyas i have done all the danam everything that is indicated in karma kanda i have done and i have now acquired enough detachment so that my mind is very dry detached and ready to absorb the teaching so that readiness to absorb the teaching is indicated by the dry twig the readiness to catch fire fire being the gnanam so here samit in the hand samit pani hi samit in the hand indicates what vairagya then what should you do you should hand over the samit to the acharya that is samit here means the dry twigs you hand it over to the teacher and do shashta anga namaskara we call it shashta anga namaskara shashta anga namaskara is what so basically you are on your you are completely prostrated and that indicates that indicates humility and that i am ready to receive your teaching so after the namaskara the shishya should openly ask for the knowledge it is not just enough to do the namaskara and sit there without opening a mouth so krishna says pranipatena 
यू हैव टू डू अष्टांग नमस्कार एंड परिप्रश्न कृष्णा रिफर टू दिस एज परि प्रणिपात एंड परिप्रश्न टू डू योर नमस्कार शो योर ह्यूमिलिटी शो दैट यू आर रेडी टू रीज द टीचिंग एंड देन आस्क क्वेश्चन ओके सो नाउ लुक एट दर्ड कस्मुन्न भगव विज्ञाते सर्व इदम विज्ञात भवती So for a person who has had no exposure to the Veda, he is saying that, you know, teach me that by which everything else is known. How would he know about the existence of such an entity is a question. Because he has not come to Jnana. So how would he know about the existence of such an entity? entity from whatever we have studied this three mantra so far is there any indication there that there is some methodology by which this person knows that there is something in in the last verse they brahman was mentioned in the para para That is a Word. parampara. No, no, no. That is a little parampara. We are not talking about the last two verses are not been studied by <laughs> by Shaunaka, right? That is only to tell us this is a parampara. Now the story is starting. Shaunaka is approaching this Angiras, and he is saying, "Tell me that about that entity, by knowing which everything else can be known." The question is, how did he know about the existence of such an entity by knowing which everything else can be known? any idea if he is a householder doing yagna in the mahashala as we have said would that give some indication of uh, that there is something beyond the karma kanda or just the yagnas very good so during the yagna you would be paying you know you would be giving your rituals to brahman right so that and and due because of all the mantras and all he would have heard these words brahman is there all pervading entity is there so in mantras there he may not have understood the exact meaning of the mantras because it is the same mantra which are going to be analyzed right so he would have heard and therefore that is the answer that because the fact that he was a grahastha and he has done rituals some amount of knowledge is there such an entity could be there that is why he is asking about that entity okay then there is one more thing which you should know vidivat right vidivat means in the prescribed manner and here in this verse it says angirasam mahashalaha vidivat angirasam upasannaha this tavanaka he approached angiras in the prescribed manner so this is the sixth part of the parampara what about the earlier five parts was this particular vidhi there or not there is no mention of vidhi there does it mean that when uh, atharvana approached brahma ji he did not do the vidhi does it mean that when angire approached atharvana there was no vidhi does it mean that when satyavaha approached angiras there was no vidhi what does it mean so that's an objection which is raised there by shankara himself Shankara gives two questions, two answers. Okay, so first he says that perhaps before Shankara there was no rule. Why? Because the parampara had not yet been firmly established. But from Shankara onwards, the rule came into existence. So he calls it the Mariyada. The 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 Mariyada Visheshana is a border line. It is a border line where the rule started. So that is one answer, which. is it a satisfactory answer it's not very satisfactory right it's you cannot have any such an important rule being you know violated or not coming into existence at all so shankara himself realizes that and he says you can also look at it from another point of view so there is uh, there is a nyaya called madhya dehali deepa nyaya madhya dehali deepa nyaya madhya means uh, in the middle deep means a lamp 
and dehali is what it's a very hindi word also is it um, the part where the from the door when you go out that the dehlis dehlis that is the uh, it is the threshold the threshold of the door okay so he says you can look at it as a using the madhya dehali nyaya what is the madhya dehali nyaya that is why the word deep deeper comes in the lamp placed at the madhya dehali the lamp placed in the middle of the threshold what does it do it casts a light both inside and outside and if you look at it from that point of view you can say that this usage of the term vidivad is in the nature of madhya dehali deepanyaya which means that same vidhi which is applicable now this side of the door was also absent applicable that side of the door and therefore from the very first itself that particular nyaya was applicable so which is a much more satisfactory explanation okay and interestingly enough the the name delhi comes from dehali can you guess why uh the city which was at the entrance of invaders or travelers or is it to do with that in a way yes anybody atraja yeah see uh, because it was the capital of the country that is what is like a threshold you know that if you cross that and that's the seat of power let's put it that way yeah correct so it was the threshold especially the muslim invaders they were there so that, that was the threshold they were inside there and they attacked the rest of the country from there so they were there inside and they were there outside so that's why it's called delhi you know we have we have though we think it's a very indian name it represents that particular time when the muslim invaders attacked from there and that's why it's called now the capital so therefore the statement <clears throat> vidivad upasanna should be taken as that those who approach the teacher earlier in the parampara also followed these rules and those who approach later also followed these rules and the non mention was simply because the earlier statements were only to point out the parampara the simple answer is that yes all those who approach the teacher did it with what upasanna and shankara adds a very pertinent note in the end is a whichever interpretation you take it doesn't matter because you anyway are bound by that rule so that is the crux okay now comes the question what is this question kasminno bhagavo vignate sarvam idam vignatam bhavati iti so <coughs> kasminnu vignate what is that one cause so mula karanam one basic cause for what all this got to supply okay there is a very terse mantra to supply all this what is that mula karanam for the universe for the jagat what is that jagat karanam by knowing which jagat karanam i can understand the entire universe so idam mean universe kasminnu vignate refers to that karanam of the universe by knowing which universe by knowing which karanam i will understand the entire product also what is that cause by knowing which i will entire i will understand the entire product it's a very very important question because only this question leads to the teaching and you can actually take any of the upanishads this question is asked in one way or the other maybe not the same words but the the basic question is the same what do i have to understand to understand everything that i know everything that i can see so ek karana gyanena sarva karya gyanam knowing that one cause understanding of all the products okay so this this is where i said because he asked this question the question was how did he know that such a cause exists and before in all these rituals 
He must have heard words like Brahma Vidapno the Paramam, all those things. The knower of the Brahman attains the infinite. All those things are there in the in the mantras. Therefore, he has one basic understanding. That is that there is one upadana karanam for all ornaments. So there is one gold out of which you have chain, you have bangle, you have nose ring, you have toe ring. And similarly, since he knows that if you understand what the gold is, you understand the ornaments also. He has derived from there saying that Similarly, there must be some material cause, some upadana karanam for the entire universe. And he is here asking, what is that entire cause? Okay. Now, we have to understand this very, very carefully. Because this can be very easily interpreted, uh, misinterpreted. So, kasminno vignate sarvam idam vignatam bhavati ti. If I know that Brahman... I will know everything. That know everything has to be very carefully understood. And so, let me ask you a question. If you know Brahman, will you know how to repair your washing machine? No. No. Then how can you say that I will know everything? So, there are, in such science shastram, two words are used. Sarvagnya and Sarvavit. So, this is a very important explanation. Both mean all-knowing. Sarvagnya and Sarvavit. Sarvagnya means all-knowing. Sarvavit means all-knowing. And Sarvagnya has a very technical meaning in Shastram. It simply means Sarvagnya knows that Brahman is Satyam. Everything else is Mithya. Sarvagnya knows that I am Satyam. And everything else is Vithya. Aham Satyam, Jagan Mithya, he knows. If you have this knowledge, everything is Brahman. Everything else is Mithya and that Brahman I am. Aham Satyam, Jagan Mithya. If you have this knowledge, you are a Sarvagnya. Okay. And Sarvavit is the person who knows everything in detail. Now, among human beings, there is nobody who can be a Sarvavit because everybody may be knowing only something in detail, right? Like an engineer, maybe a electronic engineer would know about electronics in detail. A TV mechanic would know how to repair a TV. He may not know how to repair a train. So, to know everything in detail... There can be only one one person who knows that, and that is Ishvara. Remember that Sarvavit requires antakaranam, requires a mind. And why do we say that Sarvavit cannot know everything in detail about everything? Because Sarvavit requires a mind, and knowing through the mind about a particular subject means, let us say, he wants to construct, you know, a building. He must know that through that mind, he must have the sequence, what comes first, what comes next, all those things he must know. And therefore, Sarvavit's mind is limited because he's a human being. And therefore, a Sarvavit can never be a human being because he cannot know everything about all possible disciplines. Therefore, the person who knows Everything in detail about everything, who can be called Sarvavit, is only Ishwara. And why do we say Ishwara is a Sarvavit? Because he creates the universe, he creates everything. And the creator of everything must know, must necessarily be a Sarvavit about everything. He must know the sequence of creation of everything. That is why Ishwara is Sarvavit, a jnani cannot be a Sarvavit. He can only be a Sarvagnya because he cannot know everything from the point of detail. So, from the viewpoint of the Jnani's Upadi, which is a body-mind complex, he can appreciate, he is not a Sarvavit. He is a Sarvagnya. 
in his capacity as Sarvagnya, he can appreciate that Ishwara is both Sarvagnya and Sarvavit. That is the difference between Sarvavit and Sarvagnya. I hope that's clear. Any questions? It's a very, very important thing to remember. Om Raviji. Yeah. I had a question long back about this, yes. which was about uh, uh, what you mentioned at the end, which is that to know anything, you require a mind. Yeah. And mind is always limited, intellect is limited. So therefore, the knowledge itself, what is possible to know is limited. limited. But um, then, like, how does Ishwara know? In, in it's, is it like a, 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 in a different sense of knowing? No. What is Ishwara? Tattva Bodha. Antaryami plus Hiranyagarbha plus. So Samashti, Hiranyagarbha is Samashti Sukshma Sharinam. The totality of all the minds. Which includes the minds of all the devatas. So that's the answer here that the mind is infinite for Ishwara and therefore he is able to know everything. You can't add up Jiva number 1, Jiva number 2, Jiva number 3 which is what your mind is doing I know. But you can't add up like that and arrive at Samashti. The infinite mind is beyond the totality of all finites. So that is the only way we can explain it. When you say Samashti Sukhshariram, you are saying all the West is put together. But all the Vyashtis put together in a numerical manner cannot become Samashti. The Samashti has to be more than the sum of the Vyashtis and therefore he will know everything in great detail through his mind. That mind is also Mithya. The Mithya part is okay, but we do know, um, sometimes we mention words like Mahat of a cosmic, the cosmic uh, Yeah. Uh, level intellect and those kind of things. So then Mahat is a that, term used in uh, Sankhya yeah. which roughly corresponds to Samashti Shukshma Sharir Cosmic Intelligence. The But even that would still be limited, right? Not if you are saying it's infinite. Not if you are? Saying that Samashti is infinite. See, the problem here is because we say samashti, summation of vashti. This is your engineer mind working, right? <laughs> but summation of vashti is tending to infinity, no? Right. So, when it, something tends to infinity, there is no... You cannot say at this level it crosses infinity or at this level it is not. It's finite. It is infinite. Infinite means infinite. No amount of finite can... That's the meaning of the term infinite. Beyond anything that you can think of. And therefore, when you say Samashti Shukshariram, you are saying it's an infinite intellect. And that infinite intellect alone can conceive of the universe. Because it is all knowledge which can possibly be known to anybody is stored in. That makes sense logically, but it's still very hard to conceive of an infinite mind or an infinite. Yes, it's, it's difficult to conceive of an infinite mind because. Problem is our minds are finite and therefore for such yeah. things what we do is we simply say that okay Shastram says and I have no way of disproving that and either logically or experientially so let me accept. Yeah, accepting is easy, understanding is not. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's Maya. <laughs> ya ma eti Maya. Anirvachaniyam. That is not fit into any slot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, John. Uh, so the scriptures also mention that like Brahman is the, the only one thing entity that is an infinite. So we can say that this infinite mind of Hiranyagarbha is a relative infinite. No, you cannot say that. There is no such thing as relative infinite. Maya is finite or infinite. Uh, it's infinite and anadi and, and depends on mithya. The more mithya, of course, but the more important word is anirvachaniyam, that which can never be.
categorized in any logical yes. manner. Yes. So, you know, the key to understanding Vedanta is these little, little things. When you say Maya, the more you try to analyze, you know, the more we get into that circle. We can never come out of that circle of analyzing. Therefore, it takes time, maybe say five, six years study, when you start accepting that, yes, this is something which I will possibly never understand. <laughs> so the fact is, if you try to understand Maya, it means you are not understood Maya. Oh, Macharya ji. Yes, uh, with this, uh, doesn't uh, one of the shlokas in Bhagavad Gita mention that even the universe which is created, the whole Samashti is a... Um, is in a small part of the infinite only. It isn't it a smaller uh, portion there. So the samashti sukshmishari that we say would be relative yes. infinite yes. from that portion. Tenth chapter, yes. But the point is that you know where is the line you draw where you say that a smaller portion of the infinite is not infinite. But the point we try to understand it is that this is all mithya only. So this is just said. So Brahman is so infinite and we are that. So all this is relatively, I mean, it's just words and knowledge that we are gaining. But knowledge is what the only way you get the knowledge is through words, which itself is anatma, right? Yes. So that is why. So with the regards to Medaji's question, that is what I was just trying to figure so out. The point is that you have See, the, the reason that you exercise your intellect is that you try to understand. And you keep on trying to understand until finally you realize it cannot be understood. Some things. Most of the knowledge is very clear in the, in, in the Shastra. Without the, without the detailed analysis of Anatma, you can never arrive at what is the purpose of the analysis. I said that is a sampradaya. You have to introduce the jagat, analyze it thoroughly, and then say that, okay, it's not real because it's, got, it's dependent upon Brahman. And to be able to accept that statement that the jagat is not real, you know, it, you know the, it's easy to accept that Brahman is infinite. But to accept that the universe in which I am sitting, where I am talking, where I am teaching, where I am eating, that is not real. That is that is mithya. It's a very, very difficult task. To accept that Brahman is Satyam is not so difficult. But until you accept thoroughly that Jagat is mithya, you will never be able to accept that Brahman is Satyam. That is why we spend so much time in Anatma. Because the acceptance of Anatma as mithya is the most difficult part in Vedanta. Once you have understood that accepted that Anatma is Mithya, then to accept that Brahman is Satyam is, is a small, small, you know, walk, not even a leap. Okay. Thank you. Om oh, Charaji. Yes, John. Uh, I forgot to ask the questions when I yes. commented on yes. Please, please. Huh? So, Sha Shaunaka here is, is the, that King Shaunaka, the famous one? Is the same? No. I have no idea. There are these names are very many, very different. I, I think but he's talking about Janaka. Janaka is different. Uh, Janaka, yes, Janaka. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, and the other question was, uh, when they say, "If you know Brahm, uh, tell me that which by which understanding I can know everything." Yeah, it, it's is referring to the to he wants to become a Sarvagnya, right? Not a Sarvavid. Sarvagnya. Sarvagnya. Yeah. That's, Sarvavit that's... cannot be, no human can become Sarvavit. Yes. So wh why, why he, by becoming a Sarvagnya, he understands that uh, Brahma Satyam Jagat Mitya? No, Aham is... Brahman, Aham Satyam Jagat Mitya. Brahma Satyam, Satyam Jagat Mitya is, uh, you know, it's a thing which you should drop now because yeah. you are indicating that Brahman is somebody and <laughs> So, mm -hmm. Satyam Jagan Mitya. Yes. So, why this Sarvagnya uh -huh. with Bra Aham Brahmas Jagat Mitya is considered 
to know everything if the only thing that can know everything is Ishvara, the Sarvavit. That's what I'm saying. That um, when you say all knower, that all knower is used in two particular uh, meanings. One is knowing that the entire world is nothing but Brahman alone. Mm -hmm. That is called Sarvagnya. Okay. And one is knowing how to make, you know, your toy train, how to make an aeroplane, how to make a rocket. Detailed mm -hmm. knowledge is Sarvavit. Thank you. Every human can be a Sarvavit or a limited subject. The rocket engineer will be for his area. The, you know, toy engineer will be for his area. But the Sarvavit for the entire universe has to be Ishwara only. Thank you. I can understand <clears throat> it's very difficult to assimilate that because if you are saying totality of all individual brains, then to be able to create the world, there must be some brain somewhere <laughs> which has which knows how to create the world. It is difficult for us to conceive of that. That is why I said you have to take the principle that the infinite is greater than the sum total of all the finites. Okay, so with this, we'll stop for today. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purna Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnamaya Bhavachate Shanti Shanti Om Tat Sat Om Namah Shivaya. Thank you for your patience.